On the evening of July 24, 1964, Robert Peabody, an employee at the plant, accidentally started a chain reaction that resulted in a small-scale nuclear explosion. When he arrived on the scene, they said there's been a nuclear explosion. At exactly 6.06 .06 p.m. on July 24, 1964, a 38-year-old father of nine poured what he thought was 11 liters of solvent into a mixing tank at the United Nuclear Corporation's fuels recovery plant in Wood River Junction, Rhode Island. What Robert Peabody had actually done was take weapons-grade uranium liquid and shape it into a critical mass. In that instant, he made history. In 49 hours, he was dead. This is the true story of the Wood River Junction criticality accident. Enriched uranium is difficult to produce. First, you need the uranium out of the ground. Then you need to turn that rock into gas. Then that gas needs to tumble through hundreds or even thousands of centrifuges that can separate uranium isotopes differing in mass by a vanishingly small amount. After that, the enriched gas needs to again become solid. It makes sense that countries also go to great lengths to get enriched uranium back. That was the mission at the United Nuclear Corporation's fuels recovery plant in Rhode Island. Take waste material from manufacturing and recover any enriched uranium that remained via a multi-step chemical process. In 1964, the Wood River Junction plant wasn't yet working with anything solid. Instead, as reported by the best retelling of this story in Yankee Magazine, it was processing so-called pickle liquor, liquids containing varying amounts of enriched uranium. Robert Peabody, wasn't a nuclear scientist or engineer. In fact, technician at Wood River Junction was his second job. He also worked as a mechanic. He had 10 mouths to feed. Later interviews with plant personnel would state that, quote, Peabody is energetic, but does things without thinking things through too well. Peabody is accident prone. He has recently been involved in an accident at the plant and has previously been involved in two more, end quote. True fault was never officially determined for what was about to happen to Peabody. But history would not be on the side of United Nuclear. According to reporting by Yankee Magazine, on July 23, 1964, an unidentified black goo was bubbling out of the machinery at Wood River. It got so bad that equipment needed to be shut down and disassembled. By the end of that Thursday night, everything was cleaned and put back together. The next day, Peabody's job was to deal with a collection of containers left over from the cleaning effort. Each of these bottles was filled with uranium-laden liquid. The concentration of uranium, though, wasn't clear. The initial plan at Wood River Junction was to label everything in a foolproof way. Anything with radioactive liquid in it would use physically attached, color-coded labels. Red, yellow, blue, and green would indicate descending uranium-235 concentrations, respectively. Red on near weapons grade enrichments, green labels on enrichments you could find in today's nuclear reactors. It sounded good in theory. In practice, color coded tags were never implemented at Wood River. Instead, they were substituted with stick on labels where operators would cross out contents in pen and pencil and scribble others. Every label was the same color. Adding to the potential for confusion was adhesion. In practice, the plant operators found that stick-on labels quickly stopped sticking to the all-identical bottles on account of the many chemical solvents used at the plant. So they switched from the initial plan again, this time using paper tags affixed with simple rubber bands and or scotch tape. Tags identify the bottles. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission report reads, all the bottles look the same. The tags are held on by rubber bands and or tape. They are not completely satisfactory, since tags can be easily knocked off while lifting or handling the full bottles." End quote. Not completely satisfactory was an understatement, one that would kill Robert Peabody. What was confusing him that Friday night was that the so-called safe geometry bottles Robert needed to dispose of were all poorly labeled and they all looked exactly the same. These four-foot-long 11-liter bottles were safe because their geometry prevented liquid with even high concentrations of uranium from achieving the shape necessary for a critical mass. 
These kinds of geometric considerations are pillars of nuclear safety. The cart the bottles are in also prevented multiple bottles from being placed too close together, which could again cause a chain reaction. Criticality Around 6 p.m., Peabody grabbed one of the many safe geometry bottles he needed to clean out. It was supposed to contain used trichloroethane, which cleans uranium scrap of oil. Because the chemical also picks up some uranium during the cleaning reaction, the liquid inside was bright yellow. What Robert was supposed to do was add another chemical to the bottle to bind the uranium, manually shake the bottle to get a proper reaction, and then recover the separated trichloroethane, oil, and uranium liquid. What he did instead was decide to save himself some time and physical effort and agitate the mixture with an industrial mixing vat, a choice his supervisor fought against. What Robert didn't know was that he was not in fact carrying mostly solvent. He was carrying 11 liters of highly enriched uranium liquid. Quote, the tag that identified the contents must have slipped out of its rubber bands. It was later found on the floor in the stairway. Peabody climbed to the third floor of the plant and filled this mixer with the chemical that would separate the uranium from the solvent. At 6.06 p.m., he lifted the safe bottle. He never finished pouring it. In an instant, the enriched liquid pooled into a critical mass. Hot, glowing blue liquid erupted from the mixer and hit the ceiling four meters above him. Peabody was knocked to the ground and reportedly shouted, Oh my God! While radiation alarms were blaring throughout the plant, Peabody and the four other employees were outside and running towards the emergency shack 100 meters away. Peabody was naked, clothes torn off to limit further exposure from contamination. Before he made it to the building, he fell to the ground, defecated blood, and vomited. Forty years later, a scientific study would find something terribly interesting, a rule of thumb for death by radiation. Large doses of radiation don't kill you directly. They cause enough nanoscale destruction in human tissues to eventually cause multiple organ failure, death in hours to weeks. This fate, measured in days in this chart, is directly related to the size of the dose. What this study by Gones and Wald found is that the dose is similarly related to the first onset of emesis, or vomiting. The rule of thumb they discovered is that, quote, Patients who experience radiation-induced vomiting within one hour after an incident will likely experience multiple organ failure. Back in 65, according to reports, Robert Peabody vomited almost instantly. His fate was sealed. He had just received the heaviest dose of radiation in history. 30 minutes after Robert Peabody ran naked out of a fuels recovery plant, the plant superintendent arrived to go into it, determined to stop any reaction that continued. He walked up to the third floor, removed the bottle Peabody had poured out from the mixer, and then turned it off. However, the mixer didn't drain, so he returned to the third floor to turn the mixer back on. When it was finally empty, he switched it off and moved to the second floor where he and the shift supervisor drained the liquid into safe bottles. The incident was over, or so they thought. It turns out that Robert Peabody wasn't the only person exposed that night. When the plant superintendent, shift supervisor, and four other employees at Wood River Junction were sent to the hospital for examination, the silver coins in the superintendent's pockets were sent to the Idaho Health and Safety Laboratory. The reason being is that metals can be activated by neutron radiation. The subatomic particles can bury themselves in stable nuclei, making them unstable, radioactive. Checking any metal on the superintendent could therefore be used as evidence of any dose he may have received in the plant. And indeed, the coins in his pocket were now radioactive. The best guess was that the superintendent and the shift supervisor had caused two additional criticality accidents when they removed the bottle Peabody had poured out and when they switched the mixer back on and off. Both actions again changed the geometry of the radioactive liquid inside, causing two further nuclear excursions. Thankfully, these were much smaller events, and none of the other employees evaluated suffered any long-term health effects. Robert Peabody wouldn't be so lucky. Peabody was in a hastily secured room at Rhode Island Hospital in Providence when his wife Anna and his oldest son Charles arrived. 
Somebody put a bottle of uranium where it wasn't supposed to be, he said. This was made crystal clear when the physicians told the family to stand at the foot of the bed rather than near his upper body. Measurements indicated that Peabody was putting out more radiation than you'd receive standing 100 meters from the failed reactors in Fukushima. There were fission products in his hair. Unfortunately, for a case like Peabody's, there was literally nothing that could be done. No known therapy would have been effective in saving his life, according to the study published by the doctors who were present in Peabody's final hours. Robert's body was failing on a cellular level. Less than two days later, doctors could no longer measure his blood pressure. There was none. 38-year-old Robert Peabody died just 49 hours after pouring a mislabeled bottle into an industrial mixer. He left behind a wife and nine children. Criticality considerations have been crucial since the Manhattan Project. As nuclear weapons historian Alex Wellerstein chronicles on his indisposable blog, there's even a famous story of Richard Feynman saving the weapons project at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. The story was made famous by Feynman's constant retelling of it, of course. The physicist was sent to Oak Ridge as a safety supervisor. While there, he realized that no one was really thinking about carefully positioning containers with the very same kind of stuff that Robert Peabody would handle to avoid criticality. So Feynman single-handedly came up with a new geometrically safe storage solution that the army could easily follow. Though Feynman would later talk about this criticality engineering rather flippantly, physics historian Peter Gallison recognizes the value of what was, at the time, a new kind of thinking. Quote, from April of 1944 to September 1945, whatever else Feynman was doing, he was also deeply enmeshed in the barely existing field of nuclear engineering. A billion dollar plant was churning out U-235, and only a calculation stood between thousands of workers and nuclear disaster. Authorities would never officially establish who should have stood between Robert Peabody and disaster. According to the Idaho Health and Safety Laboratory, the same lab that measured the plant superintendent's radioactive coins, when Peabody poured what he thought was solvent into the mixer that night, he was exposed to 100,000 trillion fission events. Each of these events released gamma rays and neutrons in close proximity to his body. This led to a whole body dose, according to various sources on this accident and their estimations, of between 80 and 150 sieverts. Generally speaking, radiation sickness can start at one sievert of whole body dose. 99% of humans will die if exposed to 10 sieverts. Robert Peabody was exposed to at least 10 times this amount. Quote, he probably received the heaviest radiation dose of any victim of a nuclear accident. There is a lot of confusion online regarding history's highest dose. There are accidents where individuals had body parts hit with estimated doses much higher than what Peabody received. We've talked about a few of them in this series. However, if you go by whole body dose, the worst case scenario, the 38-year-old father of nine did in fact experience the worst case of worst cases. Having his lifespan shortened from 49 years to just 49 hours, is evidence enough of that. After the accident, the Wood River Junction plant was closed for cleanup. Confined to the third floor on a plant on 1,200 acres, the excursions did not affect the surrounding area. No nuclear material was spread beyond the plant's confines. Robert's widow Anna would eventually receive his ashes, but she didn't think that they were actually his. They weren't radioactive. She reportedly believed Robert's body was secreted away in some lab somewhere. Her worries weren't entirely conspiratorial either. Just six years prior, Los Alamos had cut up Cecil Kelly's body and sent his radioactive parts around the country against his family's wishes. Kelly was also a 38-year-old technician who also caused a nuclear excursion with radioactive liquid. The United Nuclear Corporation's fuels facility reopened in the December of that same year. 1964, and operated until 1981. Today, the plant's land is part of the Francis C. Carter Nature Preserve in Rhode Island. As in almost all of these stories, human errors, not dangers intrinsic to nuclear power, are the through line. 
The Atomic Energy Commission found 14 nuclear safety violations at the Wood River plant. Eight of them were directly implicated in the 1964 accident. All of these had to be rectified before the plant reopened. I will often go out of my way to focus on obvious human error, but in doing so, I realize that you may get a skewed idea of just how often these fatal mistakes are made. To be clear, the United States' nuclear industry is incredibly safe. Of the very few fatalities you see here, only one of them, just one, is due to a radiological accident. Just Robert Peabody. The rest are industrial accidents like falls and falling equipment. In fact, quote, Robert Peabody was the U.S. nuclear industry's first and last fatality due to acute radiation syndrome. And that's a fact still true today. When Robert Peabody died, doctors assumed that his fate would be relatively common. Quote, the acute radiation syndrome will almost surely be encountered from time to time as accidents occur in the rapidly expanding nuclear energy industry. Thankfully, they were very wrong. Peabody would be the first and the last example in the U.S. nuclear energy industry they'd ever see. Fate would have it that it was also the worst. In the blink of an eye, Robert Peabody had been exposed to more radiation than anyone outside of Hiroshima or Nagasaki. Until next time.